All right, good afternoon. Here we are yet again for another lovely session of ENGR 2302 Engineering Dynamics. This will be the 14th lecture in the course series. And today we'll be finishing up with chapter 16 from the Beer Vector Mechanics book, uh, looking at some more applications of, plane mo of the plane motion rigid bodies. So I'm going to work through a couple more examples of uh, rotation and translation in plane motion. And then we're going to mo move on to a topic that, which is constrained motion um, in, uh, in, of rigid bodies in plane motion. So constrained plane motion. So we'll just see how many adjectives we can add to make this thing uh, more complicated uh, and ever more complicated, I should say. Okay, so let me work through an example problem. Yet another fun example. All right, so let us consider this. I have a disc with a cord wrapped around it. I'll have a disc with a cord wrapped around it. And I have a disc, the center of gravity is here. And this thing will have a radius of 0 0.5 meters. A radius of 0 0.5 meters. and a tension applied here, a tension T of 180 newtons. And then I'll also have, I will, I will tell us that this thing has a mass of 15 kilograms. 15 kilograms. Uh, let's see. And it's a homogeneous disc. So uh, we don't have to worry about any kind of difference in material, anything like that. Additionally, we will also say, so that we'll, we're given all of this, and we want to find, uh, A, I want to find the acceleration at, um, of the center of the disk. Uh, of the center of the disk. Uh, center of the disk. A uh, B, the angular acceleration of the disk. Um, the angular acceleration of the disk. And this is measured from the center of gravity, G, here. And then C, I want to find the acceleration of the cord. It starts from rest. Of the cord or the rope. Oh, I'm also told the value of that force, and this is 180 newtons. 180 newtons. All right, so let's, let's look into this. Uh, oh, and this uh, disc here is pinned about point G, so it will not be able to translate, it will only be able to rotate. Uh, so our first step will be to find a free body and a kinetic diagram, and then we'll be working through all of the equations to find these desired quantities. Okay, so step one, uh, draw a free body diagram and kinetic diagram. and the kinetic diagram. So I'm gonna draw two perfect circles as I always do. Perfect circle. Again, if it doesn't look like a perfect circle, that's just optical distortion. Another perfect circle. G and G. And let's say there is a, um, well, if I apply the forces here, I will have a W, weight W, and some sort of tension force here, which is T, which is equal to 150 newtons here. 
150 newtons. And then, uh, actually, you know what? I, I want to uh, say this is not necessarily going to be pinned down. This thing may actually be free to move. Um, so this will be equal then to what I wasn't actually told that this thing was pinned down, so it may actually be able to move. So this thing is M, I may have then M A Y, M A X, and then um, I alpha. I alpha. So uh, this is actually just sort of, the be best way to describe this perhaps would be, think of this as almost something like a yo-yo. It's just a, uh, a mass or a cord wrapped around a disc, and this disc is actually free to move up or down in this particular case. Uh, so I want to first uh, find the, uh, work through the three equilibrium equations to find my accelerations. So I'm going to do an acceleration. So any questions on how I got these here? These are my forces. I have an upward tension force and a downward weight. I have a uh, upward arrow showing the inertial force or its acceleration, M-A-Y, acceleration both in the Y and the X direction. And then I have I alpha, th uh, the inertial force um, from the uh, rotation. So I can do a summation of forces in the X direction, and this will be equal to the summation of forces uh, summation of F X effective or um, another way to say this is simply the summation of forces in the X direction is equal to M A X A average in the X direction or I, I, actually not A no, no, sorry not A average A scalar and then however I don't actually have any forces in the X direction so Zero is equal to m a x. Zero is equal to m a x, which leads us to that the acceleration of the disk in the x direction is zero. Then I can do a summation of forces in the y direction is equal to m a y. I think I like that one better than this uh, sum of f x effective. Um, just m a y, and then the forces in the y direction are going to be t minus w is equal to um, T minus W will be equal to M A Y. And if I solve for A Y, I can get that A Y is equal to T minus W divided by M, which will be 180 Newtons minus 15 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared meters per second squared divided by um, simply the 15 kilograms of the mass, uh, 15 kilograms, and AY is equal to, two, oh, sorry, uh, is equal to 2.19 meters per second squared. Uh, 2.19 meters per second squared, which will be upward. Yes. On the top there where it says sum of uh, forces f of x equals sum of forces f of x equals f of x. Affected, yes. Oh, EFF. Uh, EFF, that would be effective. I don't necessarily like that. That just means sort of the inertial equivalent forces. Okay. I don't necessarily like that. I, I prefer the derivation where it's like sum of forces e equals m a x. Okay, so then um, doing this, I can find that the acceleration in the y direction is going to be 2.19 meters per second squared upward. And in fact, I'm going to also put, I'll go back there, I'm just going to put a note on this for future reference that um, disk is free to move like yo-yo, not pinned down. So 2.19 meters per second squared upward. And then if I do a sum of moments about point G, a sum of moments about point G will be equal to um, I alpha, I alpha. And then the torques on here, well, let's see. 
there is going to be only one torque on here. Uh, here's a question. I have two forces. This one will generate a torque. What about this one? What about weight? Does it generate a torque? Because it's what? It's coming off the center. It's off the center. Ah, yes, we need to, in order to have some sort of torque, we need to have a, uh, a force that doesn't pass through that point. In other words, we remember this, we remember this from basic statics, of course, that if a force's line of action passes through the point that we're summing moments about, it will not generate a moment about that point. So yes, we all took statics class and know statics. Well, we took it, we don't know if we know it. Well, let's, well, let's find out. I guess we'll find out on Thursday. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, negative t times r is equal to i alpha, and that then leads to alpha equals um, negative, uh, well actually let me, before I do that, let me simplify this a bit more. i, uh, what's i? Is it like uh, um, intelligence? Is it uh, uh, initial? It's like the initial alpha maybe, or? Moment of inertia. Oh, moment of inertia. Yes, it's moment of inertia. Okay, gotcha. Yes, moment of inertia. And where do I get the moment of inertia? We could get it different ways. We could go back to our statics and derive it from. Um, we could look. At, we could look up at the equations for moment of inertia and derive it uh, by integration. Or I could look it up in a table. And if you look this up in a table, you will find that the formula in this case is uh, one half m r squared. So negative tr equals one half mr squared. That is the formula for the moment of inertia of a solid disk. Now uh, the radius here, this radius is gonna cancel out and then leave us a square there. And so then if I go and solve for alpha, I will get that alpha is equal to, uh, alpha will be equal to negative two t uh, over mr negative 2t over mr, that is 2 times 180 newtons, divided by 15 kilograms divide, uh, times 0 0.5 meters. And I will get that this thing has an angular acceleration, alpha, which is equal to 48 uh, radians per second squared. Or 48 radian, uh, or you can also interpret that as 48 radians per second per second, which will be in this direction. That's a really bad arrow. Lots of optical distortion in here today. Just so much optical distortion. The air just there must be a hurricane in here. And please, if there's any physicists watching, do not feel free to send me an email noting that air currents cannot substantially deflect light rays. Um, anyway, <laughs> so. All right, so finally, I wish to determine the acceleration of the cord. Um, finally, uh, find acceleration of the cord. Of the cord by finding the tangential acceleration of the disk. Um, at point A. Um, actually, let me label that on this diagram here. This is point A, where the cord meets the disk. So the cord, of course, is wrapped around the disk, in case that wasn't clear. Uh, finally, find the acceleration of the cord by finding the tangential acceleration uh, acceleration of the disk at point A. And this one is fairly straightforward. A chord is equal to AA tangential, the acceleration at point A tangential, um, plus, um, actually let me draw this out a little bit. This is actually, this is not actually so quite so simple. See, um, the simple case would be if this were pinned down, but um, let me draw this out a bit here to better illustrate this. Another perfect circle. Sorry, I get no end of, uh, no end to the, my amusement out of that stupid joke. Uh, so, I would have a chord here, the acceleration of the chord, and then I would have a bar 
the acceleration of the uh, centroid, and then alpha. And this together will come to produce that. So here, um, a chord, a chord will be equal to AA tangential or tangential um, plus the acceleration of A with respect to G uh, actually this should say uh, sorry this should say uh, A bar sorry about that uh, the acceleration of A with respect to G tangential that's better and then this A bar is the one we found earlier which is 2.19 meters per second squared plus See, this part here is just going to be um, an, effectively an alpha r, alpha r, uh, plus 0 0.5 meters, plus 48 radians per second squared. Radians per second squared. Oh, sorry, not plus, uh, times. 48 radians per second squared. And this will come to a total of two point or of twenty six point two uh, meters per second squared upward twenty six point two uh, radians per second squared upward. Uh, so what is happening here is this disc is spinning um, is spinning uh, clockwise, and this cord is pulling it up. But the but the disc itself is also moving. So it's like a yo yo being pulled up. That's why this is so complicated. If it were actually pinned at a support at point G, this would be a lot simpler. But uh, because of that, we have to get, when we're at looking for the overall acceleration at point A here, we are we need to consider both the global tangent, both the global uh, sorry, both the translational motion and the rotational motion. Both the translation and the rotation will contribute to the velocity here. Okay, um, so moving on a bit here. Yeah, we get sorry. Uh, the question is, can we define the direction of moment any way we wish? Well, technically, yes. You can define, just like you can define um, upward forces as negative if you, if you so wish. You, you, stay consistent with what you're doing. you can, but generally moment, in almost all cases, will consider a uh, counterclockwise moment positive. Okay, That's... I was looking at this example in the book, and they did it clockwise, so okay. I wondered about that. Okay. But generally, we would consider that. Uh, generally, we would consider it that way. But we can look at it however you wish, or you can look at it however you wish. Okay. Uh, here. Let's see what do I want to work through next. I think we got that one. It's fine. Ooh, I like this one. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna draw a perfect drawing of a car. Uh, another example. This one we're gonna look at a vehicle, a car. Okay. So I have a car here, and let's see. Um, I am told that, okay, so I'm going to draw a car, and when I draw cars, they look like hats, or big blocks of metal. So here's my car. Uh, yes, I do draw cars like I'm six years old, why do you ask? <laughs> Let me, next, I can draw a choo-choo. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, so... Uh, I have point G here. Actually, let me label that in different colors so you can actually see what the heck I'm doing. I'll go ahead and label point G here. And I'm going to say that this, I'm going to give us dimensions. This is um, from the center of the tires to point G. And I also got to give the vertical distance to point G. Uh, this will be 60 inches and 40 inches and then um, the ground is here so it's driving on the grass apparently 
and this is uh, 20 inches. And knowing here, I'm also told, so given all of this, and also uh, I am told that the uh, mu static between car and road, between tires and road, and road is 0 0.8. is 0 0.8. All right. Uh, the car, I'm also told additionally that the car is rear wheel drive. Interesting. So um, this is the front here and you can tell it's the front because, um, well, there's the hood ornament and it's a triangle. Um, Maybe some car company just has a great big triangle for a hood ornament. That would be funny. Um, anyway. Or actually, how about just a great big neon sign that said hood ornament on it? Uh, anyway, so there's that. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be the front of the car. This is the back of the car. And uh, anyway, so there's that. And uh, I want to find, this is going to be interesting, the maximum possible acceleration of the car. Uh, of the car, uh, assuming for a uh, rear wheel drive. Assuming rear wheel drive. Okay. So when I say rear wheel drive, what do you think that might mean? Oh, yes, the car is driven by the rear wheels, thank you. Uh, thank you, Captain Tautology. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, in what that's going to affect is my balance of forces, my, my force distribution. So uh, my first step will be to do the same thing I've been doing previously, which will be to draw my free body and kinetic diagrams. So a solution, uh, draw free body and kinetic diagrams. Uh, free body diagram and kinetic diagram here. Now, I'm going to draw a lot of hats today, I guess. Mm. Apparently, I draw, uh, I uh, consider all cars to be. 1950s big boat Cadillacs forever that are blo actually no this that wouldn't even work those were more streamlined than this uh, anyway and so the force is on here on the, we'll have the tires here and here and um, then dimensions I'll draw the dimensions again on this slide for reference uh, 60 inches and 40 inches. Sixty inches, forty inches, and up to the centroid at G is um, twenty inches, and that's not that clear. So I'll label that G again. Then um, I'm going to I'm going to label forces. I'm going to have N R, which is the normal force on the rear tire, and F, which is the normal force on the on the front tire, the weight. Um, which is just mg. Actually, let me just go ahead and call that mg. And then um, I will have a frictional force here. Oh. A frictional force here, which will be uh, 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 fr. Okay, so nr and f are rear and front normal force. And, uh, and, and then FR is the friction on the rear tires.
Meanwhile, I could then say these are equal to a um, a torsional di not a torsional diagram, an a kinetic diagram. Somehow the, tall, the car got taller between here and here. And then about point G, so all of these are go either going to go uh, through point G or about point G. And I would have um, MAX, mass times the acceleration in the x direction, mass times the acceleration in the y direction, and I alpha. I alpha. And this would still be the same dimensions. I'll go ahead and label those on there in case I need them. The tire here, and the tire here, and the ground here. Actually, you know, I probably want to label this one as clearly coming from the ground. It's not 20 inches from the tire to G, it's 20 inches from the ground to G. And this is 60 inches, and this is 40 inches here. 60 inches and 40 inches. All right. So um, the next step will be to do a balance of forces on these. A balance of forces in each of the three directions. Now, I'm not necessarily going to directly get um, something from these, but by combining these together, I can produce something um, useful, perhaps. So uh, here, um, actually, let me, mm, yeah, I can do it on this slide. That's fine. So the summation of forces, I'll just kind of squeeze this in here. Summation of forces in the x direction will be equal to max. So nothing really new there. Uh, oh, but however, this is equal to um, the, the only x force will be fr. So fr is equal to max. Then, so that will be one equation that I want to use. Um, that's not max, it's m a sub x, but I, I thought, always thought that was funny. Just equals max. I've got a question. Why yes. is fr pointed in the right direction instead of the left? Oh, uh, that is a good question. Why is fr pointed in the right direction instead of the left? Think about that. Hmm. Why is FR pointed in the, because the, 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 you understand that this is the front of the car, right? Yeah, it's moving to the right. Ah, see, but now you're used to, see, now, yes, that's the thing. You're used to seeing the friction pointing in opposite the direction of motion, right? And so you're, that's what you're seeing. So it's, it seems kind of odd or kind of strange to have the friction labeled in the forward direction. And the reason for this fundamentally is what is moving the car? What's moving the car? When you put it, push on the gas pedal, um, yes, there's a, ser a series of forces that need to occur before the energy from the motor or from the engine is delivered to the road. But ultimately, how your how your car as a free body diagram or as a as a isolated body is moving forward is that is it is exerting a frictional force against the ground. It is being it's going to be pushed forward by that frictional force. It's going to produce it's going to push the the earth backwards and your car forwards. So in other words, if you uh, stood on, if you're, if you had your car parked on the equator and you know, you lined it up so that, well, let me think about that. You, would you want your car facing east or west? Um, oh man, I'd have to think through the three dimensional there. Um, let's see if the sun rises in the east and the sets in the west. Let's see uh, if I look at the North pole. So it's spinning. Okay. So the sun's here. And it's rising in the, so if I'm looking at it from the North Pole, I always have to, um, so it must be spinning this way. That's the only way that would work. Because I know if it needs to rise, so, um, so it's got to be like this, two points here. So it's going to be rotating like this and then setting in the West. So the Earth, from the North Pole, the Earth has to be spinning like that. That's how you can always figure out which direction the Earth is spinning from the North Pole. Just think, well, I know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, so the only way that would work is if this is spinning like this. But anyway, so say I was on the Earth, 
and I really should have done this on the next slide or something, but um, say I know the Earth is rotating like this, right? And if I am, actually, yeah, if I want to drive toward the sunrise, this is not the, this is not to scale. Um, if I accelerate in this direction, the only way that can happen is if I push the Earth backwards a little bit. So um, when I go and drive toward the sunrise, I, ac I actually um, lengthen the day a tiny, tiny, teeny, tiny, 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 put a few more orders of magnitude of tiny in there, and uh, I actually shorten the, day, the length of the Earth's day a tiny, tiny, teensy, tiny bit. Um, very tiny amount, to the point that even if all of the cars on the planet got all got on the equator and all drove in the same direction simultaneously for years on end, um, well, actually, it would uh, it's it still would not make any noticeable difference, e even measured in nanoseconds. But uh, theoretically, I do decrease it a tiny, tiny, teensy, tiny, teeny, tiny, insy, winsy, tiny bit of nothing. But uh, technically, yes, I decrease it a little tiny amount. But then as soon as I break, it speeds it back up again, so no net change. But anyway, uh, I don't know why I want to go over that, but uh, there you go. So that's the same idea with, uh, oh yeah, frictional force on the tires. If I am going to go forward, uh, that forward force has to come from somewhere. And it's going to come from the frictional force on the tire against the ground. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Also learned how to slow the Earth's rotation. Uh, another way you can slow the Earth's rotation is... Uh, move a bunch of mass very high. So build a dam and, actually yes, when you build a dam um, and uh, keep water in a reservoir, you actually do slightly slow the Earth's rotation as well because you're moving more matter further from the uh, center of the Earth, which means the Earth's moment of inertia increases, which means, oh man, that it's ang to balance out the angular momentum, the uh, rotational period of the Earth must slow, uh, must slow slightly. Anyway, and if you wanted to increase it substantially, you could crash the moon into the Earth, but um, that would take a lot of energy as well, So, and that would come with some, some side effects. Uh, so anyway, a bit much for a dynamic experiment or a demonstration. So then the summation of forces in the y direction are, it will be equal to MAY. Oh, that's a bit wrong. MAY. And that will be NR, the summation of the forces on this will be NR, plus NF, minus W. And what is the acceleration in the y direction equal to? Good, zero, yes. And then, because um, that would be bad, because otherwise my car will be flying through the air vertically, which is something we try to avoid, generally. Uh, summation of forces in... Uh, then I'll do the summation of, sorry, summation of moments about point G. Uh, this will be equal to the moment of, of inertia, the, the moment of inertia about G times alpha. Oh no, what are we going to do? Crap. A car, the moment of inertia of, a, of an automobile is not something I can just calculate or, or it's not something I can just look up in a table. And without knowing the moment, the details of the car, now if we Got, had a very involved list of parts or a list of masses in their three-dimensional locations. Uh, through a very involved process, we could actually roughly approximate the moment of inertia of a, even something as complex as a car. But we would need to use something like Excel or something or some other tool to, you know, looking at each of the pieces of, a, of the car, calculate its moment of inertia. Are we stuck? Are we done? Do we just get up and go home? Mm -hmm. Hey, who said, mm -hmm, that's not right. No, that's not right. Um, well, thankfully, uh, what is the uh, alpha of the car? Hmm. What is the alpha of the car? Any idea? Alpha is the angular acceleration of the car. The only way we're going to get any kind of angular acceleration is if we're popping wheelies in this thing. That's the only way we're getting any kind of angular acceleration. We would have to be rearing the tires up, the front tire up, and making this thing accelerate upward, right? We would need that's the, if we had alpha, we would be on, we would be rearing up on the back tire, or um, I guess cat, or I guess we could be, you know, uh, somersaulting forward or tumbling forward if we hit a big 
obstacle or something like that. So it actually doesn't matter what, al what i is because we're not going to need it. Because alpha, we're going to uh, assume it to be zero, uh, the i will simply disappear. And then the summation of moments will be negative nr uh, times 60 over 12. 60 over 12. What on earth did I just do? What is that? 60 over 12. Why 12? Ah, because feet. Yes, to convert to feet. Uh, plus nf times 60 over 12. Uh, nf times 60 over 12. Uh, plus, I'm just taking the moment arms uh, with respect to G, plus FR times 20 over 12, and this is equal to 0. And this then will be equal to 0. Now, um, I, fed, I have four unknowns here. I have um, FR, MAX, NF and NR. So let's see if I can work with this. So um, again, four on, oh, let's skip through this. I'll put in a little note here. Continues on seven. Slide seven. And then I can do a uh, more summation of forces. So if I do a, I can say then that um, FR, well, this is going to be equal to M AX. That's what I had previously. And so the, the three equations I have so far are uh, FR equals MAX, NR plus um, uh, NF minus MG is equal to zero. Uh, and then another one that I know from um, basic definition of friction is that FR will be equal to mu, uh, mu uh, NR, the frictional force, uh, the maximum frictional force that can be generated by the tire at point uh, R, the rear tire, I should say, or the rear tires, will be the normal force at, on that tire or on those tires times the uh, coefficient of static friction. And why are, wait, wait, static friction? Static, this thing's moving. Why are we using static friction? Hmm. Why are we using the coefficient of static friction? Why do you use coefficient of static friction for a moving car? Why do you use the coefficient of static friction for a moving car? What? Why do you use the coefficient of static what friction? Is? Yeah, for a moving car. The uh, normal force times the force that's given to it? Yeah, but why do we use the coefficient of static friction instead of the coefficient of kinetic friction for a moving car? That is a good question. That's why I asked it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, hi. Uh, anyway, the, we use the coefficient of static friction because are the, cars ti are the car tires sliding with respect to the ground? They're not. The two surfaces are not sliding. Uh, the coefficient of kinetic friction could honestly be better referred to as the coefficient of sliding friction. So as long as the tires, when, a, when one uh, piece of a tire comes down and grips the road, it is not moving with respect to the ground. It is, there is no slipping. In other words, those two planes, uh, when they are in contact, are stationary with respect to each other. Does that make sense? So if you think about it, I'm, I'm going to go back here to this. Um, sort of scratch page. If you have a tire um, moving with respect to the ground, that looks like a really sad smiling face. Really sad smiley face here. Oh, it's a, a eyes and a really sad smiling face. Oh, great. Okay. Ah, oh, boy. Okay. So the way this works is, it, this is actually a great example of translational versus rotational motion. Say you have a tire. This thing perhaps is moving at, uh, the centroid of this may be moving at 70 miles per hour. At 70 miles per hour. But the tan if this thing is traveling at constant velocity, oh, I erased my tire.
this point here would also be traveling. Um, well, it would be rotating in the opposite direction. Uh, so it's actually going to be rotating kind of like this, isn't it? The tires will have to be going like this for this thing to move forward, won't it? Mm -hmm. And so the tangential velocity at this point here, um, with respect to the uh, tire, this thing is moving at 70 miles per hour here. However, with respect to the ground, uh, V with respect to ground is zero. So, in other words, as this tire spins around, when it's up here, the tire, this location of the tire with respect to the ground is moving at 140 miles per hour. When it's down here, it's moving zero miles per hour. It is stationary relative to the ground for that brief moment before it turns around again. That is how a tire grips the road. The only way it can do it if it's if it's not slipping. If it's slipping, then it will have the only way think about it. The only way it can't be slipping is if it's stationary relative to the ground. So the bottom point of the tire that is in contact with the ground is actually stationary with respect to the ground. It's not moving at all. Unless it's sliding. Um, otherwise things are getting a bit more complicated. Although if I really wanted to get things complicated which will go a bit, will go a bit beyond this course. Um, what shape is the bottom of the tire? Flat. It's flat. Huh. The bottom of the tire is always flat. Your tire is always flat. Your tire, you always have a flat tire. Did you know that? You always have a flat tire. How can that be? I'm gonna put that as an excuse why you missed the test. Oh, you, because you always have a, no, I'll, no, that goes, that's not gonna help you get an excuse on the ex exam, because if you have a flat tire, I'll just say, you always have a flat tire. Um, and the reason for this is that, okay, uh, tires are pressure vessels, right? They are balloon. They're basically big, rigid. They're basically uh, over fluff balloons. They're just overgrown balloons. Uh, tires are just overgrown balloons. And if you have a circular object, well, think about this. They have to exert their force as a pressure, right? They exert pressure to carry loads. That's the only way they can. And if you had something that was truly round, at this point here, there would be infinite stress, wouldn't there? there would, you, they would, in order to do this, in order to exert pressure, you would need, in order for that pressure to exert a force on the ground, it would have to have infinite pressure inside the tire to keep from popping. So in reality, what is always happening is some degree of flatness at the tire. Now this is definitely exaggerated. You only need like a tiny fraction of an inch to be flattened out like this, but it needs to happen. You can't support something off of zero. Or in fact, any, this would apply actually to any spherical object. I could have a, a sphere of solid steel. And if I looked at it very closely on the ground, at the point that it's supporting, being supported on the ground, either it or the ground are being bent and probably both to form either, either the ground is being formed up to an, into a cup shape to kind of support it, or the sphere is sort of flattening out a bit. In reality, both are occurring to some degree. Every, nothing is perfectly rigid. So yes, if you ever say, tell me that I can't make it to class, I have a flat tire, I'll just reply, you always have a flat tire. It's the nature of tires. It's flatter than normal. Okay, that is actually a scientific just, scientifically justifiable answer. I, can't, I cannot come to class, my tire is flatter than normal. <laughs> um, anyway, at which point I would tell you to take Uber. Um, or a cab, or my, or actually, my favorite thing to do is uh, if somebody emails me saying me they're uh, telling me that their uh, car won't start, I just send I just reply back with a single link that just says ridemetro.org. Um, anyway, uh, ridemetro.org. You can always take the bus. Uh, well, depending when this, depending where in the city you live. Uh, anyway, so fr is going to be equal to mu nr. And then we also have our, so I'm going to label these equations uh, one. Actually, let me label these maybe in a different color for, actually, I'll, I'll label, I'll write down my other equation here. Uh, so perhaps I have a negative nr, this is the one from the balance of moments, times 60 over 12, uh, plus nf times 40 over 12 times 40 over 12 plus FR times 20 over 12 and all of this comes to zero. Then um, let me label these equations here. 
Oh, I'll label this one 1, because we're going to do a whole bunch of little balancing equations. Uh, this one 2. Uh, this Actually, no, sorry. This one 2. I cannot make up my mind today. No, sorry, I really can't make up my mind today. Uh, this one here is 2. This one here is 3. And this one here is 4. Now, let me put 1 into 3. If I substitute 1 into 3, I get an equation that says nr, the normal force in the rear tire, is m times ax over mu. So getting, slowly building this thing up, and that will be uh, the um, equation 5. Now let me put 1 and 5 and 6 into 4. So now I have nr, I have um, fr, and fr here. Actually, not here. Let me put uh, 1, 5, and 6. Um, wait, where is... Actually, no, sorry. Let me get. Let me build 6 first. Sorry about that. Um, I will put 5 next into 2. So this one into this one. And doing so, I will get that um, here, that nf is equal to, well, ff, nf, the normal uh, force at the front is equal to mg minus nr, the normal force at the rear, which is equal to mg minus max divided by mu. M, uh, sorry, a, um, oh, sorry, uh, let's do a, uh, sorry, max divided by mu. Just remember max. max divided by mu. Then if I take 1, um, 5, and 6 and put them into 4, uh, 1, 5, and 6, some substitution, and put them into 4, I will get the following equation, which is negative m uh, ax uh, over mu uh, times 60 over 12 times 60 over 12 plus uh, mg uh, minus max divided by mu uh, times 40 over 12 plus max times 20 over 12, which is 0. And then, uh, what can I immediately do, though? What do you see that is constant between all of these three terms? The mass. Ah, mass, 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 mass. Cancels out. The mass cancels out. And so then, the only unknown I have is, uh, is ax. And if you substitute in the G and the coefficient of static friction, if you work through this, you will find that AX is equal to 12.3 uh, feet per second squared. 12.3 feet per second squared. 12.3 feet per second squared. And that is the maximum acceleration that this thing can undergo. Or, in other words, what is that? That is... Um, 12.3, if I wanted to interpret this differently, let me do a quick calculation here. 12.3 uh, divided by 9.8, that is approximately 1.34 g's. Now, that does not mean this thing is actually capable of this. This is just, so this is kind of interesting. This is the maximum for, or this is the maximum acceleration that this car can undergo, regardless of how powerful an engine is in this car. Doesn't matter how powerful an engine I have in this, the, uh, the car cannot accelerate any, any faster than this. So what if I want to go further? What if I want to put in a bigger engine and make it go even faster? What, could I, what else could I do? Better tires to use static friction. I could possibly put in better tires to have a higher coefficient of static friction. Yes, that would be one option. Um, that would definitely be one option. Uh, I could probably fiddle with the mass distribution. So um, 
I don't, looking at the mass distribution, I don't know without doing some math that that's the ideal mass distribution. Uh, so remember how we said that the, um, we, I gave you dimension, or I gave us dimensions for the, both the height and the distance front to back of the centroid. We could probably improve things a little bit by either moving the centroid forward or backward, depending, and I would have to think about whether that would, would whether, or what would be beneficial or not. Uh, so we could play with that and sort of figure out which would be the ideal. Um, so that would be one way to do it. What else? So, and then beyond that, we could look at more exotic things. And so, uh, and also notice this is independent of the mass. It doesn't matter what mass I have on here. Um, why does the mass just cancel out? Well, um, wouldn't adding more mass help us? You'd think it would, wouldn't it? At one level, you think it would. I mean, doesn't wouldn't, wouldn't more mass mean more frictional force, etc.? So why won't mass help us? Hmm. The reason mass won't help us, ultimately the reason mass won't help us is that, yes, by adding more force, I do increase my frictional force and increasing my, my acceleration force. However, I also increase the amount of mass I need to accelerate. Hmm. So yes, by adding more, by making the car heavier, I would increase the frictional force, but I would also increase the amount of matter that I have to accelerate in the first place. So that's the problem. Now, um, however, uh, one question. Uh, sometimes in uh, you, what you don't do in northern climates during the winter, uh, on slick roads, you sometimes add mass above the rear axle, right? Any idea why you do that? The idea is to increase traction. I'm sorry, I'm asking the wrong people. They're all from Texas. Um, anyway. Um, uh, I'm asking the wrong people here, but uh, sometimes you do that up north. That's very common uh, treatment to handle uh, slick roads and things like that. And uh, that's that there is not so much about uh, there. You're trying to increase um, the ability to break rather than the ability rather than the ability to accelerate. Although uh, although I guess increasing traction can help as well. There, it's more about um, you're fiddling with the mass distribution more than anything else. You're fiddling with the mass distribution more than anything else. Uh, so there's that. I have one more conceptual example I want to work through, then we'll take a break. Come back and look at constrained plane motion. Uh, constrained plane motion. So uh, one thing, this is just a conceptual question. Uh, let's say I have two things. Um, consider a cylinder and a pipe. A cylinder and a pipe. of the same mass, of the same mass and outer radius. Uh, same, ma uh, same mass and, and radius. So both are released on an incline, let's say like a 20 degree incline or something. So one is a hollow ring And the, they're at the same slope, the same material, so we don't have to worry about frictional forces or anything like that. Both made of, I don't know, good strong American steel or something. American steel. Huh? American steel. Good strong American steel, yeah. I always use that line in my uh, steel design class. It's good, st good stuff, good strong American steel. It's good stuff. Uh, anyway, so that's 20 degrees, and then we have here just a solid uh, shaft of some sort, a solid cylinder, and they're both released from rust. Both released from rust. Uh, which will uh, have greater acceleration? Um, Or will they be the same? You may have seen this type of problem before, but maybe in your physics class. But what do you think? Any thoughts? Which will have the greater acceleration? And I, by acceleration, I mean translational acceleration. 
So I'm not, uh, which will have a great, or, or another way to think about it is if I release them down the, uh, if I put them side by side, which will reach the bottom of the ramp first? Huh? They're the same mass. The same mass. So maybe they wouldn't actually be the same material. I guess I couldn't, um, I could either, to make them the same mass, I would, either have to, I would either have to use different materials or I would have to perhaps, um, I could make them out of different materials or I could just make one longer than the other one. Um, that would be another option. Uh, if I wanted to keep them the same material, I could make one simply longer than the other one. Because the key is I'm, I'm saying that I want to keep the outer radius the same. That's important. So what do you think? In, in this case, your instincts are correct. Yes, the the uh, them reaching the bottom at the same time is too easy. They do not actually reach the bottom at the same time. They do not have the same acceleration. My favorite way to analyze this is from the point of view of kinetic energy. Okay, so uh, just can someone remind me of the formula? I can't remember. Can someone remind me of the formula for rotational kinetic energy? I can't remember. Hmm. Maybe I can't remember. It's K okay, rotational equals one half I uh, omega squared, right? One half I omega squared is our formula for rotational kinetic energy. And of course, Ke translational is one half uh, M V squared, where V is a translational uh, velocity, right? And um, the potential energy gravitational is MGH. Now, if I release an object from here, whether it be the wheel, whether it be the, the cylinder or the pipe, uh, they have the same mass. Same mass. Uh, same initial well of MGH, of gravitational potential energy. Uh, gravitational potential energy. I can't get something for nothing. I cannot get something for nothing. So, um, I cannot get something for nothing. And the only way I get any kind of kinetic energy is by trading a uh, potential energy for it. Does that make sense? There, I can only get so I can only get motion if I trade height for it. I can only get height if I trade motion for it. Or there are other ways to do it as well. But if we're looking purely from the state, the standpoint of kinematics, that's the only way. Um, so that is going to be our only path. And uh, in other words, and, and since because of both of these are uh, both both of these will be equal to mgh, uh, I am limited here in the sense that. Um, I only have so much energy. So the more energy that goes to rotation, the less is that is available for a translation. The less to translation. And, uh, and what determines rotation? Well, rotation is determined by I. I is a basically a measure of, now it's, it, you can, it's basically the integral of mr squared, right? Remember that? I is integral of mr squared. Um, but another way to think of this is, conceptually, I think of I as a measure of how much stuff is far away from the center. Of how much stuff or matter or mass is how far from the center. In other words, for the same mass, even if, regardless of the actual inner and outer diameters, well, actually, with the same outer diameter, uh, an outer diameter, an OD, uh, the I for a ring must be greater than the I for a, 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 a circle, right? 
Does that make sense? It's because the moment of inertia is measuring the uh, the moment of inertia is measuring the um, is ha measuring how much mass I have, how far from the center. Yeah, how much mass I have, how far from the center. And so the only way that's going to work is if I um, if I have that. Does that kind of make sense? It's a measure of how much mass I have, how far from the center. Um, and so the more material you have far from the center, the higher the moment of inertia. And this means a higher moment of inertia, higher I, leads to higher Ke rotational, which leads to a lower Ke translational. There's no such thing as a free lunch. If I have um, if I have more energy going to rotation because my eye is higher, I know then that my energy available for a translation has to be lower. There's no such thing as a free lunch. I can I can dedicate more of energy more of my energy to this or more of my energy to this, but every joule of energy that I take from the for, that I take from this that I or sorry every joule of energy that I I'm using that to go toward rotation is a jewel of energy that cannot go to translation. Does that make sense? And so, because of this, um, the ring must have a higher, uh, must take more energy to rotate. Uh, to rotate due to its uh, must take more uh, energy to rotate due to its uh, what to its uh, higher I therefore it will have a lower uh, ke translational therefore a lower final velocity and therefore a lower average acceleration. So I actually used energy methods, although we could also look at this from a force balance perspective, if we, if we wished. But I thought it would just be a little bit simpler to look at this from energy, although I'm probably getting, when using such an energy method, I'm probably getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves, because I think we'll see that more in later chapters, but I was just really borrowing some ideas from certain physics classes. All right, that will, that will do it for this portion of the lecture. Let's take a short break, come back, and we'll look at this uh, some more. All right, and thank you.